but that Captain Yao in honor died for nation when God had perished, I shall too carry on unto death for Mars, for Mars and for the Donager. Hello and welcome back to my episode of Generation Films. My name is American Ben. The MCRN Doniger, the former flagship of the Martian Congressional Republic Navy's Jupiter fleet, was the pride of the Martian Navy. The battleship was over 500 meters long and weighed in at about 250,000 tons. The ship was the epitome of Martian engineering, which far outclassed anything that Earth had to offer. The ship served a variety of functions for the Martian Navy, from protecting shipping lanes to, as Captain Yao explained, anti-pirate activities. Fortunately, I got to spend three years cleansing the belt of pirates who were poaching terraforming supplies intended for Mars. In other words, the ship didn't have much of a history in organized war and didn't face down imposing enemies very often. Captain Yao even admitted to James Holden that most of her crew's experience came from simulations, and her own combat resume mostly included bullying pirates. The only combat most of my officers have seen is in simulators. Design-wise, the Doniger didn't break much from MCRN tradition aside from its size. The ship was built like a narrow office building, with each of its levels layered one on top of the other from stern to bow. At its stern, the ship housed its Epstein drives, which under burn would provide gravity within the ship. Working our way along the bulkhead, the ship was covered in thick armor plating and had a rather sleek appearance, which was only further enhanced by its orange and black coating, the MCRN's official colors. The ship's elegant design worked its way inside of the ship, which a human in the pre-extrasolar age might find akin to the interior of a German-designed luxury car. The ultimate flying machine, if you will. As you might have assumed from the Rosinante, which we explored in an earlier video, everything in the ship was supremely well designed. Maybe we can force the door. Mars builds too well, you know that. Damn, we the ship's many levels contained all sorts of facilities, some of the first of which we see are prison units. The ship certainly was no Mormon farm paradise love boat like the LDSS Nauvoo, aka God's Thumbtack, which had to be reconfigured into a warship by the Belters when the OPA seized it, a process which included reimagining livestock stables as holding cells. Nope, the Doniger had a healthy prison industrial complex. The ship had cells designed for holding individual prisoners and a larger holding cell complete with safety seats for high-G burns as well. The Doniger also set aside room for interrogating detainees. I really like the design of the table console in this room. Rather than look like a screen, it actually looked like a table, but could indeed display information on its surface. I'm telling you, Martian design is top notch. Also, Martian lights are high powered as well. God damn, those are bright. One of the most prominent features of the Doniger was the massive hangar it housed just past its midsection towards the stern, which could hold up to eight support ships, including, of course, the Tachi. Outside of its docking bay, the Doniger had a pretty sweet mechanical arm with a claw on its end that could be used to grab docking ships and pull them in, a la an arcade-type claw crane game in space, but not rigged. I feel like I'm going to begin to sound like a bit of a broken record when I say that everything in the Doniger ran out from the bridge, which was so quintessentially Martian engineered. The ship might have been relatively massive, but the bridge was compact. No more space was used than necessary. Actually, its bridge wasn't much bigger than the Rosinante's bridge, a ship that was stored within the Doniger. The captain stood in between two upright consoles, which he used to operate the ship, a bit of a departure from the table consoles that we see in the OPAS behemoth and the Rosinante, but still a similar idea. We didn't really get to see enough of what these consoles do, but it seems to me that their functions were split. From what I can tell, one console was used more for internal video monitoring functions, and the other was used more for radar and other external monitoring functions. Though I'd guess that if needed, either console could do whatever the other one could, and we even see that they can each do multiple things at once. At each of the four corners of the bridge was stationed one crew member each, with a screen in front of them and tablet attached to their chairs from which they could work the screens. The function of these displays seemed to be mostly related to radar, analysis of radar information, and communication. Now, as you may be beginning to see, the bridge was designed to be easy to use and understand. Maximizing function was favored over maximizing technology and crew. And given its simplicity and compactness, Captain Yao was able to exercise complete control over the space, easily and instantly communicating with the crew around her and working with them to operate the ship. The Doniger's bridge was, in a phrase, intelligently designed. Both the Rosinante and the OPAS behemoth were integrated with holographic mapping technology that their crews could operate by waving their hands within the holograms. The Doniger seemed to have an even more advanced version of this software. 
The crew could seamlessly transition readout information from holographic display to screen display and vice versa. And they used their holographic tech to operate and monitor the Doniger's weapons as well. As far as armament goes, the ship came fitted with 14 torpedo tubes, 6 fore and 8 aft, which could be fitted with a variety of different warheads attached, whether nuclear, plasma, or fake snakes. The torpedoes were used at long range only, but contained guidance lock technology, which the crew could use to drive them into their targets using radar. Torpedoes are away. Guidance lock on all targets. The ship's 59 40mm point defense cannons positioned around the outside of the ship could then be used in close quarters combat. These cannons were incredibly accurate and powerful as we witnessed when we saw them take out multiple Amun Ra stealth fighters when the Protogen ships assaulted the Doniger. And if the Doniger's PDCs could bring down those ships, there probably weren't very many ships in the Sol system they couldn't bring down. Then of course the Doniger had two ultra heavy railguns, which were the big mamas of railguns in the Sol system. It was one blast from these babies and you're done. That said, the rail cannons were rather exposed on the outside of the ship and could be destroyed with enough return firepower. Defensively, the ship seemed rather capable as well, in my opinion. The six attacking Amun Ra ships didn't exactly seem to be able to penetrate the bulkhead of the Doniger with their fire, though that's not exactly what they were aiming to do anyway. Now, I don't actually know what the extent of the damage that the Amun Ra's PDCs, torpedoes, and railguns did to the integrity of the Doniger. But what I can say is that aside from some shaking, the bridge of the Doniger was well insulated from external attack. And when we saw around the inside of the ship after it was assaulted and breached by Protogen's mercenaries, the ship seemed mostly intact in terms of structure. Now, of course, the ship was eventually overcome by the Amun Ra fighters, and that contradicts the notion that the Doniger was well armored. But it fell for a number of reasons. First of all, there was a bit of a design flaw in terms of its power consumption. When Captain Yao called for the railguns to be brought up, power had to be diverted from the rest of the ship to fire them, and ultimately this led to the Doniger's main drive overloading and having to be shut down. Lieutenant, the main drive is overloading. We have to shut it down. If you watched the video I did on the Amun Ra ships, you'd know that I think that this was the aim of the Protogen Force in the first place. They never thought they could actually beat the Doniger shot for shot in close quarters battle. Power overloading issues are rather common in the Expanse's universe. We saw the OPAS behemoth systems fail at one point when Kamina Drummer tried to launch a missile. That was a ship designed by an Earth-based company in Tyco Manufacturing. But clearly even Martian engineers haven't quite figured out efficient power management when it comes to using heavy weaponry. Actually, the Doniger was configured to mount an additional two railguns, but the MCRN couldn't take advantage of the extra mounts because of the ship's power shortcomings. Power consumption aside, I also thought that it wasn't exactly ideal that the Doniger's crew was rather green. I mean, yeah, they had simulation experience, but video games are not the real thing, lest we should be sending Call of Duty champions to get Bin Laden. Alex Kamel failed a simulated Thoth station mission every time he tried it, and then in practice he succeeded because come game time his true skill was put to the test. Beyond the inexperience of the crew, Captain Yao had also grown rather arrogant after years spent easily putting down pirates with her much more capable ship. Well, whoever they are, and whatever they've come to do, it's just become a suicide mission. The Protogen ships were the first encounter she and her crew had with technology that could rival and even surpass what the MCRN had, and the Protogen mercenaries were no pirates either. I've mentioned before that I assume that they were former elite soldiers of some sort. Though the Doniger had capable soldiers on board as well, who probably would have performed much better given a more coherent plan from the top. In all, when her crew first notified her of the inbound Protogen ships, had Captain Yao taken the threat more seriously, perhaps the outcome would have been different. That said, ultimately she was the victim of misfortune. She and her crew ran into technology they had never seen before, and it's always hard to be ready for what you don't know. And honestly, kudos to Captain Yao. In the end, she didn't hesitate to set Condition Zero and scuttle the ship before the Protogen mercenaries could take control of it, a process which could be initiated with the press for thumbprints against a couple of special shards that acted as a sort of key for activating the self-destruct sequence. The resulting massive explosion destroyed everything in the ship's proximity, including the Protogen mercenaries, and prevented the massive ship and Martian tech and information from being stolen. Though it did kind of seem like Captain Yao was overly eager to die a glorious death. I kind of respect her for that though. Anyways, that's the video. Hope you enjoyed it. Let me know what I missed down in the comments below or just comment. I want to hear from you. Give the video a like 
If you enjoyed it, subscribe to our channel and hit that notification bell. Let me know what other Expanse content you want to see. For now, my name is American Ben, and I'll catch you next time. Generation Films, peace.